Faith for Today with Colin Urquhart and Julia Fisher. So how should we as individual Christians and as churches, as church leaders, be looking at 2010? That's the theme of our programmes this week. And uh, you made the point very clearly on yesterday's programme, Colin, that each one of us as individuals has a responsibility to the whole, to the body, which is the church, that our actions, our emotions, what we say, what we do affects the other. This is particularly true, obviously, of leaders. But it's also true of every believer in the way that I described yesterday. Now, let me earth what I've been saying the last couple of days uh, with some scripture. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul says this, So this is my message to you. Because you have already received Christ Jesus as your Lord, continue to live in him. You have been rooted in him, so now grow up in him. Let your trust in him continue to grow stronger as you live in the good of what you have been taught and let your hearts overflow with thankfulness to God. Be sure that no one puts you into bondage through clever-sounding but empty talk that is the result of worldly thinking and dependence on the traditional way of looking at things instead of being revelation of the truth in Christ. For in him, the complete revelation of who God is has come to us in human form. In Christ, you have been given the fullness of his life, and he is supreme above every authority and power. Because you live in him, you have received a spiritual circumcision, not one done by men, but by Christ himself. This circumcision involved cutting away your old sinful nature, which was buried once and for all with Christ when you were baptized. Now you have been raised to new life with him through believing in God's power, that as he raised Christ from the dead, so he has also raised you from the death of sin to a new life with him. You were spiritually dead because of your unforgiven sins, because that old nature, that old sinful nature, had not been cut away. But then God brought you to life with Christ. He forgave all your sins and cancelled the written code of rules and regulations that were impossible for you to keep and only consigned you to failure and defeat. Jesus removed this code by nailing it to the cross. There he also disarmed the demonic powers and authorities that oppose us. His triumph over them on the cross was a public defeat for them. Now, uh, this is reading from the Truth Bible, or Truth New Testament, which brings out the the meaning of, of the Scripture. And it's very clear what Paul is saying that as Christians, God has already equipped us in every way that is necessary for us to enable to do his will and to be the witnesses in the world that he's called us to be. He has already dealt with that old life that stood in opposition to him, that sinful nature that wanted to please self rather than to please God. And he's given us a new nature, made us a new creation, a new people, He has done that work in our hearts that enables us to be the people of faith, the people of authority and power, that he has already given us, therefore, the fullness of life in Christ. And on the cross, he has already overcome and defeated everything that could come against us. He has actually given us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is not high in the sky, pious talk. This is the revelation of truth of what God has already done for us in Christ and the people that he has made us because we are born again and have received the Spirit of God and have become the new creation. Now, what I believe God is saying 
is live like that. Believe what I've done. Live accordingly, both in your individual lives and corporately as my church, wherever that church exists. Now, of course, what Paul is saying here to the Colossians is only the outworking of what Jesus said to the disciples at the Last Supper. There he said, Abide in me and I in you. Continue to live in me, and I will continue to live in you. This was the amazing thing that he was going to make possible through the cross and resurrection, and then through the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he was telling the disciples at that time that they were grieving because his presence was going to be taken from them, his physical presence. But he said something even more wonderful is going to happen. He that is, has been with you is going to be in you. Now, we can see uh, what those disciples were able to accomplish when Jesus was with them. As we read the Acts of the Apostles, we see what they were able to accomplish when Jesus came to live in them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, now that same Christ, that same Holy Spirit, is living in us as believers today. So should we not anticipate, should we not expect to see the similar outworking of that life, that love, that power in our lives as was possible then. It doesn't mean that the church didn't have problems. You've only got to read the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles to see that problems abounded aplenty. That just as there were people that were opposing the truth and were operating even within the church under spirits of deception then, so that is the case today. Uh, we've only got to see how Paul encourages the churches to which he writes, to live the truth, not just acknowledge the truth, to see that the problems then were very similar to the problems now. But what we see is the way the church was advancing, the, the way the kingdom of God was being extended, the way that whole nations of people were being impacted by the gospel. And surely there are so many more believers today than there were then, especially in a nation such as this. We can, should be, able to make a difference. And I hear a lot of Christians today paying lip service to that. We're going to make a difference. Okay, good. That's fine. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. But how are we going to do it? We're not going to do it simply by saying God is calling us to make a difference. We've got to live the lives that will make a difference. Live those lives of faith, live those lives of love, live in unity with one another, and be the witness that God has called us to be. Sure, the early church had its problems and challenges, Colin, but one thing they didn't have that we do have is they didn't have 2,000 years or sort of a denominational culture that many of us are stuck in. And you've just been reading there about bondage and, and wrong spirits and all the rest of it. Are we not bound by some sort of a spirit of religion very often? And how do we break free of that? Well, that is true. But uh, I began my ministry 46 years ago when that was even more true. And what I've seen during those 46 years is God moved by his spirit to deliver people from their denominational thinking, from their traditional ways, and bring them into the life, the liberty, and the freedom of the Holy Spirit. So we've had a measure of freedom, but do you think we've got stuck in a bit of a but, groove again? Well, no, what I've seen is that having enjoyed that freedom and having faced the challenges that that freedom brought for a period of time, that many have reverted back to the traditional way of doing things, to their denominational thinking, to the compromises out of which God had delivered them. And of course, when churches do that, they lose their cutting edge. And, in, and instead of making a difference, instead of impacting people in the world around, they, they begin to lose ground. They lose people. They, uh, they get, therefore, a survival mentality instead of a progressive mentality. And that's sad. It's very sad 
for me to see how there were some wonderful, wonderful years of freedom and unity right across denominational and uh, uh, and church lines. Uh, you know, people even ceased to care about what denomination were, and the 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 unity that we experienced in Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit transcended our differences. And there was a, a kind of a a recognition, well, you may see this differently from me, you may, you know, have a different doctrine about this from me, but actually we are united in Christ and we can move uh, ahead together. In fact, kingdom faith was a kind of a, a, a prophetic witness of that because it originated with people coming from different church backgrounds, different theological backgrounds, and living together in community and working together for the common cause of the gospel. And we respected each other's differences, but we never allowed them to divide us. And and uh, yet, you see, what there has been is a progressive sort of shrinking back into our not only our denominational enclaves, but our traditional enclaves. Because, you know, even churches that came into existence 20, 30 years ago can become traditional by now and have lost the vitality and the challenge that they experienced in the, in the early days. So are we in a worse place now? I don't think we're in a worse place. No, no, uh, because there are many that have gone on and many new and wonderful things that are happening uh, in the church world at present. But we're in a time where we really have got to take stock of the situation. You've been listening to Faith for Today, presented by Julia Fisher. This program is sponsored by Kingdom Faith. For further information, visit our website, kingdomfaith.com. 